thank you so much for the invitation. I am I'm trying to figure out who I'm talking to here. Um, I always I always feel much more important now that Veronica has introduced me. And uh, I I would it's true I would like to talk today about responsibility. I should first say a caveat that watching what is happening now um, and watching what my Ukrainian friends and colleagues and students are doing in Ukraine. I feel like I, I am the last person who can take any credit for having courage. <laughs> I generally think of myself as a very neurotic, fearful person. Um, Ukrainian colleagues have given me a lot of credit for, for intellectual courage, um, which is very sweet and I'm very grateful for, but I would never compare that to physical courage. Um, I do believe that if you're going to write, you have to you have to speak the truth or there's no point in being a writer and there's no point in engaging in the public sphere, that that's why we're here. Um, but that's very different, you know, from somebody firing a gun at you, you know, or hiding in a bomb shelter. And I have never counted on myself as somebody who would have physical courage in those situations. So I, I feel very embarrassed now when I get credit for any kind of courage because that speaking the truth is what is what we all have a responsibility to do if we're going to speak um, and i i like to think of that as not a special form of courage but simply a form of responsibility um, so i think i'm here to give you your inaugural pep talk um, and perhaps some jewish motherly advice if i understand my my function correctly um, you're all young and those of us who teach, I think especially, we're always desperately looking to the young generation. You know, we always look to our students, you know, with this tremendous hope that this is going to be the generation that saves the world. My students know I'm constantly telling them, you know, we're counting on you to save the world. And one of the reasons I say that is that I feel like there's a, a unique moment of opportunity and it comes from being old enough to have really understood the problems, you know, and the crises and the moral traps, but young enough not to have absorbed all the reasons why it's impossible to fix them. <laughs> that moment before you understand why it's impossible to fix something, but you understand what the problems are, that's your moment. <laughs> you know, that's when you have to, that's when you have to go out and do the impossible. Um, that's when you have to go out and do the ex unexpected. And I'll, I'll get the unexpected as a concept from Arendt that I'll get back to in a moment. I'll try not to talk too long so you can ask me questions. Um, so I think you're, you're coming from Poland, from Belarus, from Ukraine. Um, you're, you're older than my kids. I have a, a almost 11 year old and a 13 year old and they keep asking me so a bit older than Veronica's daughter. And they, they keep saying, how could you bring us into such a horrible world? Like, how did we get so unlucky? You know, why are we growing up with, with Trump and, and Putin? And like, why are we growing up with, with the plague and coronavirus and, and global warming? And how did you give us such a horrible world? And I, I constantly feel guilty about this, you know, and I, I wish you have kids and you'll see, I mean, Veronica knows, I don't know whether the rest of you have kids yet, but like if you, if and when you do, you will see that you want to give them a better world. And so everything that is wrong with the world weighs on you, especially heavily because you want to give them a better world. Um, and you can't tell them it's okay when it's not okay, because kids will know that you're lying. I mean, you have to tell them the truth. So then the question is always, you know, what can we do and, and how can we fix it? Um, and I, of course, have no magical solutions. If I, I had magical solutions, I would, you know, happily, you know, employ them and put them to work and save the world. And then we could all go home. I always tell my students at, at Yale this as well. Like if I had answers to these great historical questions, I would very happily just give them to you. We could be done in five minutes and we could all like go home and take up gardening or something nice like that. Um, the problem with all the big questions is that you know we don't have magical answers. Um, but I, I, wanna, 
I want to throw out a couple things um, to you right now, drawing on a couple of my favorite philosophers, especially since you're young. I feel like I, I, I tempted to talk about Hannah Arendt. I'm always tempted to talk about Hannah Arendt because she's one of my great loves. Um, but I, I discovered Hannah Arendt when I was 19 um, and read her for the first time. And I still remember the thrill of discovering her. And that has been, she's been with me all these years. Some thinkers I've gone through phases of being intensely attached to and then move further away from, but Arendt has always been with me. So I want to use her today. Um, and I, I want to talk, I guess, about, about a couple things. Um, I want to talk about subjectivity, um, which is a tricky philosophical concept to talk about, and it doesn't always translate well into all languages. Um, it's actually much clearer in Polish than it is in English, because you can distinguish in Polish between subjektivność and podmiotowość. I think in Russian, you can distinguish between subjektivnost and subjektnost. So I'm talking about podmiotowość and subjektnost, the state of being a subject as opposed to an object. And that is just to say an actor, a responsible agent, you know, as opposed to a passive thing. Um, this is one way to understand the Maidan. It's one way to understand, you know, what was called the revolution of dignity is to understand it in these Kantian terms, you know, and Kant said that, you know, any, anything that has, anything that can be replaced by something of equivalent value has a price and anything that is beyond all price and admits of no equivalent has dignity. You know, human beings are distinguished because we have dignity and therefore follows the categorical imperative, which is you always treat a human being as an end and not a means, which is a way of saying you always treat a human being as a subject, as a responsible actor, as an agent, as opposed to an object, something that is acted upon. Um, and one of the things that I have watched, you know, over over the past years in all, all of these places in Russia, in Ukraine, in Belarus, in Poland, um, they all come back to a question of subjectivity and what it means to be a responsible agent, what it means to be an actor. Um, when the Maidan happened, which I realize for you, because you're young, probably feels like it was a very long time ago and you were much younger, whereas for me, it feels like it was last year, even though it was almost 10 years ago. Um, one of my, my Polish friends said, you know, well, Marcy, podmiotowość, you know, subjectivity. I haven't heard that word since the days of Solidarność. You know, and that was a word that the Polish opposition was using in the 70s and 80s. It's a word that Adam Miknik injected into the into the conversation. He writes about it. You know, Kostek Gebert writes about it. But basically, it's the state of being a responsible actor. You know, it's what it means to take responsibility. Um, and that was very much that came to be at stake on the Maidan. And one of the things I've been thinking about as I've watched this gruesome war, this grotesque war, and all of the discussions it has opened about Russian imperialism, about colonialism, about what it means to be colonized, what it means to be a victim of imperialism. And I think in some sense, the really interesting question about Russian imperialism here is how is it then that subjectivity has emerged on the part of the colonized and not on the part of the colonizer? Why is it that Russian society at large has experienced a crisis of subjectivity and you do not have a critical mass of people who feel themselves to be responsible agents? And how has this sense of subjectivity come to Ukraine? You know, you know the, the colonized in this scenario. It's a kind of variation on Hegel's master-slave dialectic. You know, is it really the slave, paradoxically, who, who has agency? And I've been thinking about that a lot, um, both in 
in watching what's happened in Ukraine and how much that country has changed, you know, in the time, you know, in the 20 some years since I've been going there. Um, I've been thinking about that in trying to understand the anthropological catastrophe, as my Ukrainian writer friend um, Volodymyr Rafayenko calls it, that is Russian society, what has happened, what has gone wrong. Um, I was thinking about that watching the protest in Belarus a few years ago, you know, in which feminists played such a strong role. Um, and what they one of the things that they were looking at that was remarkable, I mean, I think it was a, a new reading of feminism, which is the reading of feminism we all need, you know, saying that we need a model of strength, we need a model of agency that is not associated with abuse and cruelty, but is associated with caring and nurturing. You know, can we replace this idea of, you know, bielts not cheat lubit or real men beat their wives or strength is associated with, with, with siloviki, with being able to batter the other person? And can we create a model of, of agency a model of responsibility, a model in which what we see as power and strength is associated with caring for one another, with what Olga Sparoga is calling you know, horizontal solidarity, is associated with nurturing. You know, can that be a new normative model of, of subjectivity? Which I think is absolutely the way you know, that, that feminism should go. I think it's the way we should all go. Um, they had that the feminist in Belarus explained to me how the language that they had developed to talk about domestic violence became a language for the whole society to speak about how they were being treated by a tyrannical regime. And I think that offers us a clue in a more universal way into where we might go. You know, how do you create a notion of responsible subjectivity you know, that is then not based on showing one is an agent by beating somebody else up, but is rather showing one is a responsible agent by feeling a responsibility for one another in this world. Um, and that may sound very utopian, but I see flickers of it. Like I, I saw flickers of that on the Maidan. That was the miracle on the Maidan. It was this moment of revelation that we human beings are capable of something better even if we don't see that side of ourselves very often. And that's what I saw watching from a distance in Belarus. Like we human beings are capable of something better. The fact that we are capable of it, even if for a flicker of a second, for an Augenblick, um, as they say in German, that means that we're capable of it. That means that we have a chance. That means that, that it's not impossible. Um, so I'll just say a, a couple more things about that. One has to do with historical memory because I'm a historian and we always think about these things. And one of the conversations I'm involved in now um, with colleagues from, from Belarus, from Ukraine, from Lithuania, from Poland, from Russia, is trying to understand what went wrong in Russia, what has gone wrong in Russia. Um, and Sergei Lebedev, um, among other kind of Russian thinkers, has written very movingly about how it has to do with a failure to confront the past and a failure to look at the past with eyes wide open, a failure to look at Stalinist crimes with eyes wide open, you know, not because people who are living today are guilty of what their great grandparents might have done, but to take the responsibility for facing that past with eyes wide opened. Um, I feel like that's one of the things that has really happened in Ukraine to a much greater extent than elsewhere. It's happened in Poland over the years. I've seen it. I've, I've been going to Poland now since the 1990s and there is pushback you know, and there is attempts to silence those voices. But I think overall, and here I'm going to seem like an optimist, I think overall the voices that are devoted to facing the truth are winning. <laughs> I think that's penetrating the consciousness of your generation. I think it's only when we take responsibility 
for looking the truth in the eyes and saying, this is what happened. This is our responsibility is not to atone for sins our grandparents or our great grandparents might have committed. Our responsibility is to look back with eyes wide open, understand how things that were horrible and abusive and cruel happened, and then take steps to make sure they don't happen again. You know, our responsibility is to understand so that we don't end up in this moral abyss, so that we don't find ourselves in circumstances in which morality completely breaks down and we say, well, we were just going along with what other people were doing, or we were just going along with what those in power told us to do. You know, now we have the chance to take that kind of, and I see that in the progress that Polish Jewish relations has made. I see that in the progress that Ukrainian Jewish relations have made. I see that in the progress that Polish Ukrainian relations have made, that there's a possibility, there's a chance for your generation to say that we're going to have the courage and responsibility to look at the past without excuses, you know, but with a sense of responsibility for understanding and with a sense of understanding that the present then is in our hands. Um, of all the things I have been tearing my hair out trying to understand about Russia, the anecdote that was most revealing to me was one I heard from a sociologist friend in Vienna who is my generation, so born in the 1970s. She grew up as a Jew in Soviet Kiev, studied in Petersburg, then did a doctorate in Germany, and her, her career has all been in the German-speaking world in Austria and Germany. But she has always been a sociologist working on the post-Soviet space. And in the couple years after the Maidan, she went back to Russia and she was doing interviews there. And she said, you know, she was asking people, among other things, what can, what can be done today so that Stalinist terror doesn't happen again? And when she came back to Vienna, she said, Marcy, not only did people not have an answer, they didn't understand the question. She said, for them, Stalinist terror was like, and she used the word in German, Naturgewalt, which is like a violent act of nature. It's an earthquake or a tsunami or, or a rainstorm. What can we do to prevent the rain? I mean, best case scenario, we have an umbrella in the closet. But I feel like that, that was the key to the pathology. Not that people have an inherent disposition to cruelty or sadism, but that sense of what can we do? You know, things just happen. They fall upon us. You know, and our job is not to say things just happen. Our job is to take responsibility. Um, one of the things I tried, I looked at when I was obsessing about how to describe the Maidan was I was looking at notions of time, how time changes during revolution, how people experience time differently during border moments, you know, very border experiences, extreme experiences, you know, how time either disappears or becomes faster, becomes slower. And I, I read a lot about the philosophy of time while I was thinking about this, you know, and one of the things I began thinking about was Jean-Paul Sartre's notion of, of time. Um, the present has always been very difficult for philosophers. How do you define the present moment? How do you define the now? The now has no duration. You can't hold on to it. As soon as you try to catch it, it's already gone. You know, and, and Satra's idea of the present is that the present is a border. The present is a border between what he called the ansoi and the poor soi, which imperfectly translates into English as the in itself, the for itself, or facticity in transcendence. And what that means generally is that the present is a border between what has already been, what has happened, what cannot be changed, what is inert, what is immobile, who you have been up to this moment, and the future as a possibility of going beyond, as a possibility of something else, as a possibility of transcending what has been and who you have been. And that ordinarily, 
every moment of our lives is that present, is that border, is that possibility to go beyond, but we normally don't notice it. And what revolution does, what extreme experiences do, what the, the Germans call, call Grenzerfahrungen or the Doschwechenia Granitsnia, um, is it cast a glaring light on the present, you know, as that moment of the possibility to go beyond. Um, and this will bring me back, and this is the last thing I'll say to what was Hannah Arendt's answer to Heidegger's notion of what defined the human condition. For Heidegger, what defined the human condition was our finitude, which is our the fact that we all die, the fact that life is always moving towards death, because every every life every life is always ultimately going to end in one's death. That's what he calls you know, the the human finitude. Um, and Hannah Arendt said not that she denied that. But she said, but what is more significant than death is birth. And so instead of finitude, she uses the word natality, natalnosh, the quality of being born. And she uses it to refer not only to literal birth, but also to the possibility that human beings have to begin some new action, to set something new in motion. She calls this the miracle that saves the world, the possibility of setting in motion something new. And I'll, I'll leave you with one Hannah Arendt quote, and actually I'll, I'll put it in the chat too, um, if, I, if I can figure this out. This is from the human condition um, so that you can absorb it on your own time. She says, the new always happens. And this, I've been thinking about this quote. I first read this book many years ago. I taught it several years ago again. And I've been thinking about this, watching what Ukraine has done and how Ukraine has Ukrainians have resisted in this war. I've been thinking about this Arendt quote. The new always happens against the overwhelming odds of statistical laws and their probability, which all practical everyday purposes amounts to certainty. The new therefore always appears in the guise of a miracle. The fact that man is capable of action means that the unexpected can be expected from him, that he is able to perform what is infinitely improbable. So we are now all counting on you and your generation to perform what is infinitely improbable. I'll stop talking now. Yes. Okay, uh, Marcy, thank you. I sincerely thank you for your amazing speech. Uh, I'm sure everybody uh, has uh, lots of thoughts and uh, even questions. Uh, I've already received our first question, uh, but before uh, I ask it, um, please, uh, if you have any questions, raise your hand or write it on the chat. Uh, I'm sure we, you all have some thoughts or some feelings. Uh, it doesn't have to be a question. It could be just your reflection on the topic. Um, so uh, first of all, we have this question. Um, you talked about responsibility. Do you think that uh, a part of taking responsibility is teaching the new generation about subjectivity? Is the thought of viewing yourself uh, as a person first gonna um, make uh, seeing other people not as a mass, but uh, as a group of individuals easier? Yes. Um, yes, in my opinion, yes. Um, at, at all, in, so I'm, I'm an intellectual historian, which in English means it's a weird phrase that doesn't translate well into other languages. But basically it means that I, I'm a historian of, of ideas and thinkers and intellectual life. Um, so I write a lot about history of philosophy, for instance. And in the history of philosophy and the history of European philosophy, you know, there's, there's a trend where whenever things get really too dark and creepy, European thinkers start saying, Zurück zu Kant, back to Kant. Well, why do people want to go back to Kant? Well, there's a sense that Kant is a grounding point. Kant gives us a kind of moral grounding point. Um, and this idea that, you know, what distinguishes human beings is that we have dignity. And the fundamental moral rule 
is to always treat another person as, as an ends and not a means, as a subject and not an object, you know, as a, in a non-instrumental way, but with respect for human dignity. I think that's a good grounding point for all of us. You know, it, it's old, it's not new. It's been around for a long time. <laughs> it's not my new idea. But I don't think anyone's ever come up with a better one. I think that's where we have to start. You have to start with a basic respect for the fact that we are, we are responsible human agents and we have a moral obligation to treat other people that way. Everything else kind of follows from that. And it's both the question of how we act towards others and how we see our own responsibility. There's, I mean, one of the arguments I've tried to make about in these memory war battles um, about is that we spend too much time talking about guilt and apologies and repentance and not enough time talking about responsibility. All the more so because the guilt that we're talking about, whether we're talking about the crimes of Nazism or the crimes of Stalinism, is guilt that was that was possessed by people who are no longer here. I don't actually believe that guilt can be inherited. I don't believe we are guilty of what our ancestors have done. Um, but the thing about guilt, more importantly, is that guilt is contingent. You know, in Russian, you would say uslovno. Um, you know, that guilt is, it depends upon what you did. Guilt is about something that you might or might not have done. Um, in kind of philosophical terms, I want to make the argument that responsibility is not contingent. It does not depend on anything. It is transcendent of, of guilt or innocence. It is always already present. There's no escape from it. it it's not dependent on what you did or what you didn't do or what your grandparents did or didn't do. We are all, all of us, always already responsible. And I think that has to be our starting point. Thank you so much. Uh, guys, please share your thoughts uh, in the chat box or raise your hand uh, on the Zoom call so I can see uh, who wants to share with us. Uh, if you're uh, still uh, thinking, you can uh, write uh, any of your thoughts uh, in the chat box. And meanwhile, uh, I got another question. Uh, it's more of, I think, a thought than a question. Uh, somebody wrote, so we should do things because they are improbable and that should mm -hmm. not stop us. Do you agree with that? Um, yes. I mean, I especially for young people. Because I feel like the the burden of <laughs> the burden of age is that you're too aware of all the reasons why nothing can work. You're too aware of all the lost battles. And the only chance we have, the only chance we have is to do that thing that seems radically improbable, you know, and to do it in good faith. I mean, I, I'm, you know, I'm speaking from America where nobody thought. You, nobody thought Ukraine was going to last 72 hours. Um, everybody thought it was crazy that they were going to fight. You know, and when, you know, you know 4 a.m. when Kiev started being shelled and the Americans offered to evacuate Zelensky, um, and he did that crazy thing by coming out onto the streets in Kiev at night with you know, four guys from his team and filming the selfie video as there were assassination squads out there, you know, and saying, you know, ya president tut. That was crazy. Um, that was crazy in a variety of ways. And I, the Americans thought that was crazy. Um, now, had he not done that, we would all be living in a very different world now. Sometimes, mm -hmm. <laughs> sometimes you have to do the thing that seems wildly improbable, unexpected, impossible. Sometimes there's an opening. Sometimes there's a moment. You never know. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, we have a question from Stanislav. 
Uh, Miss Shaw, I have a question about the role of history in mm -hmm. everyday life. Putin often tells about uh, history, about historian heritage. What do you think about the role of history in everyday life of, how to say, normal people? Mm -hmm. Do they think about history? Is it conscious or unconscious? Well, that's, that's a great question. And it varies very widely. Um, because, of course, history, some people do, some people don't, some people think about it, some people don't think about it. Americans tend to think about it less. Historians always cringe because we feel that most people are thinking about it in a very distorted, propagandistic way, you know, for their own purposes. I mean, to be fair, when Putin first wrote that article about the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians in 2021 and Somebody, one of my former students, you know, sent it to me right away. She was very upset. And I looked at it and said, this is just ridiculous. I didn't even take it seriously. I thought, you know, he like, <laughs> you know, he has this idea. He has that idea. We're in a post-truth world. I mean, I, I, I didn't, I very naively didn't think that, you know, this might actually be the template for the third world war. I mean, I knew there was a possibility of a third world war, but I didn't actually take that text very seriously. Um, I mean, there are things that if you seriously study history, you know, there are, are always, there are, first of all, there are never two moments that are exactly the same. There's no such thing as identicality, but there are also always universal elements in any given specific situation. You know, so there are things we can understand. I mean, one of the things history teaches us is in some sense that anything is possible, you know, and the thing that we think is inconceivable can become the new normal three weeks later. And when I'll use an American example, you know, when and Americans are very bad at thinking about history. Um, when in November 2016, which again feels like last week to me, but probably feels like quite a while ago to all of you, when Trump won the election, um, and you know all of us here at the university were kind of walking around in, in a state of like shock and terror, and soon enough, a lot of my colleagues and a lot of Americans started saying, "Okay, this is bad." This is very bad, but it's going to be okay. We're going to get through it. We're the world's strongest liberal democracy. We drink in our liberalism with our mother's milk. We have checks and balances, which is a very American phrase, just meaning we have a division of power. You know, Paul Jalwadzi. Um, I don't think checks and balances exist as a phrase in any of these other languages. We have checks and balances. He won't be able to do anything too terrible. And people started repeating checks and balances like it was a yoga mantra, like breathe in, checks and balances, breathe out, checks and balances. It's going to be okay, you know, whatever happened. And, I, and as a historian, and especially as a historian of Eastern Europe, I thought, we're like the people on the Titanic saying our ship can't sink. We've got the best ship, we've got the biggest ship, <laughs> we've got the strongest ship, our ship can't sink. If you actually study history, what history teaches you is that there is no such thing as a ship that can't sink. Thank you. Uh, we have a time uh, for one last question. Thank you, Stanislav, so much. This is exactly what we mean uh, by uh, trying new things and, uh, you know, getting to know uh, new things and learning. Uh, it's all about asking questions. So we encourage you to ask questions. Uh, this is your time. We have, uh, as I said, time for one more question. So please raise your hands if you want to ask or write it in the chat. Are, are you all in the same place or are you all zooming in from different places? You're We're all not. zooming in from different places. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you all feeling ready to go out and save the world? If you are, you gotta be ready to ask a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, 
So uh, I will uh, end our session. Thank you so much with my own reflection because I really am viewed as a hopeful person. My friends say that I'm a huge optimist. And I thank you so much for uh, telling us that there's still hope and light in the world. I really love uh, the take on, uh, on death and uh, you said natality. Uh, I, I really uh, I really stand with what you said and thank you for sharing. And uh, it was truly an honor to hear your speech. So once again, thank you so much for that.